Good Rita. morning and welcome to this session on quest for sufficiency and sustainability of Indian power sector. The power sector is the backbone of the economy. No sector can function without it. Therefore, the need to attain energy self-sufficiency and energy security becomes paramount, requiring both supply of diverse energy sources and demand to go hand in hand. At the same time, ensuring that this growth is sustainable and contributes to India's climate commitments and sustainable development goals. We are honored to have the presence of Sri R.K. Singh, Honorable Minister of Power and New and Renewable Energy Government of India, who has ensured that the power sector remains a beacon of resilience in these pandemic times and even embarked on a series of reforms. We are delighted to begin our power pack session with welcome remarks by Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, President Fiki. Over to you, President. Good morning and namaste. A very, very warm welcome to Sri R.K. Singh, Honorable Minister of State, Power, New and Renewable Energy, and Minister of State for Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. To all our other esteemed guests from the government, industry, multilateral and bilateral agencies, other organizations, members of FICI, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to this exciting session on India's quest for sufficiency and sustainability in the power sector. India, one of the world's major growing economies, is set to recover from the disruption of the COVID-19 and will emerge stronger than ever before post-COVID-19. And one of the factors that this revival is attributed to is the stimulus and the reforms announced by the government to revive the economy. During the course of the pandemic, the government has taken several effective measures to continue 24 by 7 power supply for every area, whether it was manufacturing, of course, hospitals, run ventilators. This was carefully and adequately monitored by the Honorable Minister. And sir, we know your effort in this and we thank you very much for everything that has happened. We also want to commend your role in the movement of the, towards the Atmanirbhar package. Uh, but going forward, sir, we also would like to talk about the very important aspect of the energy needs of our country, uh, who is looking to create this kind of growth momentum, an 8 to 9 to 10 percent growth momentum, becoming a $5 trillion economy. We look forward to the continued focus on power so that we can grow our power requirements. The country's demand for power, and today, of course, we are energy self-sufficient, but the demands are expected to grow five CAGR, and to meet this growing need, uh, the reforms that you are undertaking is something that we are really looking forward to hearing about. Uh, we believe that the impending draft electricity amendment bill is critical to usher in the reforms that you are speaking about. We also are fully appreciative of the fact that the power sector is currently in a state of transition and witnessing a rapid change from the electricity mix. India's target of achieving 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2022 and 450 gigawatts by 2030, supported by policy and regulatory push, has really put India on the top countries in the world for promoting renewable energy sources. However, expanding the renewable base also requires adequate investments in the grid modernization and in keeping with that also the new push on manufacturing, whether it's solar cell or battery. We commend these moves, we appreciate them and commit on behalf of Fiki, sir, that we are here to partner and to play a critical role in every way possible. I also would like to truly congratulate you on the fact that India attracted $64 billion worth of investment in renewable energy in the last six years and is set to cross the 100 gigawatt renewable energy capacity mark. Uh, considering the installed capacity of renewable energy uh, to over 90 gigawatts. And while the government has given a strong supply side push, uh, we also look forward to appropriate initiatives on all the downstream requirements, which also we're hearing about, electrical vehicles, battery recharging, solar energy adoption in residential, commercial, and industrial sectors also has a huge in, uh, 
uh, potential which you have spoken to us about and we are we are actually energized uh, by so much of your thoughts on the greener energy avenues uh, especially also for the agriculture sector the government special scheme for farmers uh, to bring about this capability is something that we have uh, truly appreciated whether it's the installation of solar pumps the grid connected to solar power plants and of course the successful implementation of the saubhagya scheme which has led to the electrification of so many households in the country so transmission companies reliable electric grids smart grids the interface between suppliers and consumers wide scale technology adoption installation of the prepaid meters all these are very many items on your path and as we warmly welcome you not just to speak at our conference but for the we welcome you for all the great initiatives that you have taken up and we look forward to hearing your thoughts uh, on behalf of fikki sir it's uh, it's a very well warm welcome to you to your initiatives and uh, to our continued working together namaskar guys there's a pleasure to be here president Yes. Thank you, President. May I now invite Honourable Minister Shri R K Singh to deliver his keynote address. Over to you, uh, Dr. Samrita Reddy, President Tiki, Mr. Uday Shankar, the President Elect Tiki, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. We have been interacting, your committees and myself, and uh, my officers, and we have been interacting closely. This is actually a serious paradigm, which actually our government has brought about. I remember a time because I have been in government for a long time. I remember a time when this close interaction with the industry was not happening. That is because we did not realize, as a country, we, we even though when we became independent, we were bitten by the socialist bug, and uh, we did not actually realize that economic strength is actually a precursor to. uh national strength it's a uh, necessary attribute of national strength as well and economic strength comes from industry and commerce and therefore we have to work as partners this is something which the western world realized very early but we realized it but that realization has come in our government and you will find across our government a very close interaction with the industry as we go along we made committees to look at revival of demand which includes industry and uh, we realize that our future lies uh, with modernization industry commerce economy unless we make our economy strong our country can't become strong and if you want the economy to be strong you have to have a strong power sector because the power sector is the basis of all economy everything runs on power by uh, hospitals industries you name it now before our government came we were power deficit uh in past four five years we have added about 139000 gigawatts of energy generation capacity power generation capacity. and today we are part of it uh today our established capacity is about 374 gigawatts which is double that of our peak demand and uh, at the same time we carried out paradigm shift in the entire structure of the power system we connected every part of our country into one grid we connected ladakh in for the switches of arunachal right myanmar border for the switches west right down to kanyakumari before our government came to power you know we could transfer about 33000 megawatts from one corner of the country to another today we can transfer about 1 lakh megawatts from one corner of the country to another that that's the shift we have made and the strengthening of the grid country in the past 5 years we have added 1 lakh 42000 circuit kilometers to the grid and that strengthening will continue we created green corridors to handle the injection of renewable energy the large scale injection of renewable energy we have set up renewable energy management centers 15 of them we more important we connected every village and we connected every household in the past 
uh, you know, the, we connected in, under Sobharia program, we connected about 28 million households in 18 months. The International Energy Agency called that the fastest expansion of access ever, anywhere in the world. And that's true. No, in no other country has this happened, such a sort. Uh, so the, and not only that, only generation and distribution, but also uh, generation and transmission, but also distribution. Under Dindya Gramjyoti Yojana and IPDS, we sanctioned schemes for about 2 lakh crores for strengthening the distribution system. We created new, about 2,600 new substations. About 3,000, we augmented about 3,000 substations. Lacks of kilometers of uh, ST lines and LT lines we replaced. Uh, we gave money to the states and discounts for changing their transformers wherever they were burned. Everything, the entire gamut. And about 70 to 80% of our schemes are complete. And the remaining the four or five states have asked for extension, they are also going to be completed. So we have revamped the distribution. Now all this, the net result of what, what, what does this all lead to? The net result of all this is that the availability of power has increased. The average power availability in the remote corners of our country used to be about 11 hours before our government came. By the last five years, we brought it up to 21 hours, 20 watt hours. Now it's about 22 hours. But that's not that does not satisfy us. We want the average power availability to go up to 24. We want 24 by 7 supply. Energy transition, uh, which uh, is today the you know the centerpiece of global discourse. Now there we have emerged as a leader. Uh, we are the fastest growing renewable energy capacity in the world. That's what us saying. It. That's independent analysts saying. It. The volume of our bids in the past four years has surpassed the volume of bids anywhere else. We grew our solar capacity 13 times. And uh, our overall renewable energy capacity has grown about three or two, you know, two and a half to three times. And we are still, we will we will continue growing at that. Place. In fact, we will grow at a faster pace as we iron out to whatever difficulties are there. We have emerged as the most attractive destination for renewable energy, uh, for investments in renewable energy. As uh, Dr. Sangeeta said, in the past four years, we have attracted about six years, we have attracted about $64 billion. And every major fund in the world is invested here. That is because uh, we, we have designed our systems in such a way that it's transparent. And we have set up a transparent dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, we, uh, are very, you know, we are very clear in our mind that sanctity of contract is most important. Now, all that is attracting investment. We had pledged in COP21 under our NIDCs that by 2030, 40% of our established generation capacity will be from renewables. Now, it's already at near about 38%. And if you add the capacity of the construction, it's already about 50, it comes to about 52%. By 2030, we will have 64% of our capacity coming from non-fossil fuels, 65% in fact. So we are actually well ahead in so far as the energy transition is concerned. In fact, we are the only major economy which is on track with the trajectory required for reducing the, uh, the temperature rise to 2 degrees. We are the only major economy which is on that trajectory. Now, uh, so these are things to be uh, happy. But if you ask me whether I'm happy, I'm not. I'm worried. I'm worried because of the require because of the sustainability factor. A large number of our distribution companies are loss making. Now that is what uh, is is a major factor for what. Uh, most, most of these, in fact, all, all the discounts which are loss making are state owned. None of the private discounts are loss making. The ATNC losses of the private discounts, so all the private discounts is less than 10 percent. And they are all making profit. In fact, the franchises are also making profit. The state owned discounts are making the loss. 
Now, this these losses have have consequences because they are making losses. Therefore, they are not able to pay for the power, which causes stress upstream and dampens investment. Because they are making losses, they can't buy power. So they'll uh, resort to load setting. Because they are making losses, they can't maintain the system. And this has been happening for the past some decades, many decades. And every five years or seven years or so, the central government, you know, injects money to strengthen the distribution system. It's not maintained and it runs around again. Now, all these are consequences of the dis uh, losses of the state discounts. Now, why are these losses there? We have analyzed it very closely. One major reason for the losses, surprise, surprise, is the inefficiency in billing and collection. That's such a simple thing. But I mean, if I'm talking about inefficiency, billing and collection also include theft and losses. Because whatever uh, electricity is stolen is not built. If that is set right, then every discount we have calculated, every discount will become profit. That's a simple thing. Now, to address this, we said, in fact, I've been saying, you know, I've been writing to the states for the past couple of years that shift your metering system to prepaid meter. So that will do away with the human interface in uh, meter reading, etc. Which does not happen, by the way, in rural area, in North India, you know, my constituency. It does not happen because the number of meter readers have come down. The distribution companies have not recruited. The drill of regular recruitments which we follow in the central government has been lost. So when people retire, you know, the, the, their replacements are not uh, recruited. So you don't have meter either. So they have contracted it. And the supervision over the contractor is left. And therefore, there is, you know, the meter does not happen or there is uh, table use. And uh, the other problem, of course, is that if you send a bill, you know, for three, four months at a time, the consumer cannot pay. I cannot. If you give me a four or five months bill at a time, I don't think I can pay. So, uh, so metering is important, and we have a program for that. Now, the good thing is that many states have started. Other major reasons for losses is that the states announce subsidies. Good, and you are sovereign; you can announce subsidies, but you have to pay the money for it. Now, that's where they fall short. Now we have to devise ways and means to make sure that they give the money for the subsidy which they've announced. Announce whatever subsidy you want to. You want to give free electricity, please do so. But pay the money for it. Because electricity is not free. The coal companies have to be paid. The freight has to be paid. The workers have, who generate power have to be paid. Now this is something which I keep driving to the state. Now the major problem, if you look at the root cause of all this, the root cause is actually coming back to the 2003 Act was a major reform. But at the same time, it did not go far enough. And therefore, it has left behind this problem. You know, what it did was that it separated the finances of the power system from the finances of the states. So now what happens is that the decision making continues to be taken by the state. But the consequent losses of the subsidy not paid or theft not stopped or billing efficiency is not improved, the burden of the losses falls on the discount, which is separated from the state. Their finances are separated from the state. So there, the state's borrowing capacity, the state's fiscal situation does not get into That is the harmful impact of the reform, which is the inadequate or part reform which we carried out. If we were separating the distribution system, we should have separated entirely and we should have, we should have de-licensed it as we de-licensed generation. I think that that is the way to go. But right now, so the causes, we have to address these causes. Uh, not only this, there are other methods which the states adopt or which the SCRCs adopt at the behest of the states. Incidentally, that is another problem in the structure. The regulator who is supposed to be at arm's length 
is actually appointed by the state government. And therefore, he is not at arm's length. And therefore, he acts on the state's behest. So in one state, I will not name the state, the tariff has not been revised for three years. So, so it's making huge losses. In another state, huge debts have been incurred for some other projects, which are only partly connected with electricity. So the discount is saddled with the interest burden. And in most states, the pressure is, pressure on the regulator is not to keep the tariff high, to adopt strategies to keep the tariff low. Now that means that the entire cost of supply is not recovered, which leads to loss. And then again, the states are not concerned about the law. We have, I have interacted with the finance commission. I have returned to them. I made presentation, and I said that the uh, losses of the state-owned discounts should be, are, are truly the contingent liabilities of state government, and they will be added to their contingent liabilities so that their borrowing space shrinks. Once that starts happening, then the states will wake up to the, you know, the uh, requirement for making the discounts healthy. There are other steps which we have taken. You know, to ensure payment, we have put in place the letter of trade system. There we have said that uh, power will not be dispatched until unless you give the letter of trade for the quantum of power which you want to purchase. That has been put in place. Unfortunately, what I have been uh, informed is that some gen codes are actually conniving with the state government and uh, indicating to the regulator that they have uh, received the LC when they have not. This is to ensure that their power continues flowing. They don't want the flow of power to stop. I understand that. Setting a generation, uh, you know, the uh, switching off a generation station and then restarting is a problem. But if you want discipline, if you want to make sure that there is a relationship, certain relationship between supply and payment, you have to adhere to that discipline. You have to make sure that if the payment is not made, you cut off the supply. If LC is not given, you stop supply. Otherwise, this discipline will not come. And you will, you will all revert back to the state you were in before all the before this system was put in place. That's the danger. So don't dig your own grave. That's my message to you. Abide by that discipline. And if a letter of credit has not given, then don't dispatch the power. Don't indicate to the uh, to the uh, controller that you have got the letter of credit. You are, uh, uh, otherwise, the whole uh, you know, the system is there to help you. Will not be able to help you unless you can. You stand up and fight for yourself. Nobody can fight for you. The problem for me is the problem for me is that the demand is growing. It's a, I mean, it's a happy thing. I'm calling it a problem. It's a happy thing that indicates that uh, you know our economy is growing. In October. Our demand went up by 12%. Even in December, day to day, the demand is 5 gigawatts, 5,000 megawatts to 10,000 megawatts higher than the corresponding day the previous year. So we are back on the growth path. And we shall grow. And we'll grow faster. Because these 28 million consumers are adding appliances and they are consuming more and more power. We shall grow faster because our economy is growing. Currently, our uh, national electricity consumption average is one third the world average. That will triple. We'll catch up with the world average. That means three times our capacity. But for that, I need investment. And investment will not come. Investment will not come unless and until there is viability in the system. Unless and until the people who put money, who invest money, are assured that the power which they generate and sell is paid that is the sum, that is the basic problem of sustainability which we face. There are a number of things uh, which we have done. As I said, the letter of credit is one thing. The other is we have changed the prudential norms of the power finance corporation and the rural electrification corporation, and we made them adopt the prudential norms of the banks. So now we have provided with with, with one concession. We have provided that any loss-making discount will not be able to draw funds from PFC or REC. They will not be able to get loans from PFC. 
Now that is a major step because they used to finance their losses and continue their operations by drawing money from PFC and RDC and the PFC and RDC used to oblige. Under different heads, they used to keep getting the money. So the indebtedness of the discounts grew, but the system kept, kept running. I have said nothing good. If a discount is making losses, then that means it's a bad risk, then you cannot lend money. That's simple. I have made only one exception. I have said that if the distribution company uh, right, you know, the, works out a trajectory for loss reduction, gets that state government's commitment to it and files it with us and adheres to that loss reduction trajectory, then we shall consider the need. So that we have put it. The other thing is agriculture. Now, agriculture is a problem. It's not a problem per se, it's politicians who have made it a problem. You know, different politicians in order to garner votes have, uh, you know, declared agriculture free, you know, we'll give you free electricity, etc. Et et As I said, please, you are welcome to do it, but pay the money for it. So they won't even pay the money for it. But uh, the recent technological advances have provided us with the solution. The solar revolution has provided, the RE revolution has provided us with the solution. So we have worked out a scheme. Now uh, that is a scheme which uh, will benefit the farmers hugely, and of course it will benefit the whole parcel. We've, uh, we've said that uh, you solarize all your agriculture. You so if you solarize your agriculture, we give you 30 percent of the cost as grant. 70 percent the NABAD will give you as well. We work, we have tied it up with NABAD, and of PFC and RC will also give you. Now that loan gets paid off in just what five years we have calculated by the amount of agriculture subsidy which the state government gives to the district for the power provided to agriculture. Five years flat. After five years, and the agriculture subsidy given by the states to the discounts is ranges from about you know the thousand crores for smaller states to about twelve thousand crores for Uttar Pradesh per annum. Five years, that loan is paid off, and that system becomes free. The farmer gets electricity, free electricity during daytime. Now he gets at night during daytime, at no cost. The state is rid of the burden of annual outgo of twelve thousand crores in case of the price of five thousand, six thousand crores on an average. Where you don't, and apart from that. The uh, irrigation days are only about 120 out of 360. For the remaining 240 days, you get power without cost, which you can sell and make money, which a discount can sell and make money. So I, we have added a twist to it. We have said we have laid down norms per for the pump. And if a farmer consumes less power than uh, his, uh, his pump capacity or the agricultural capacity, then we'll give him a, give him a set. So this is a scheme which is a win-win scheme. Once this happens, we shift our entire agricultural load, which is about 115 gigawatt, to renewable energy. We reduce our carbon footprint. We reduce the consumption of this. I have said that where you don't have agriculture feeders, we gave lots of money under uh, the Dindyal grant you know, for separating agriculture feeders. We propose to continue that in the new, new scheme, which is there before the finance bill. Continue giving the money for separation of agriculture feeders. Apart from that, I have told the state that even if you, uh, if there is some delay in the scheme, that's uh, you know because of financial stringency, the Lamad will lend you money for it. We have discussed with them, and that also gets paid off in another you know, from five years. It, the payment period goes up to six years. That's it. In six years, we will still uh, start. After six years, we will still start saving about six thousand crores on an average per annum, which you can use for constructing schools and hospitals and roads, etc. That once that happens. Then the power system also gets uh, more becomes more viable because one major problem, as I said, is the announcement of subsidies and the money not coming. But uh, there's, there's another thing which we thought could happen because of uh, so as to stop his loss, and that was that we said it would be you disinvest. If you disinvest, the burden of all these losses will not be on you. And uh, the uh, investor who steps into your shoes, in the state government's shoes, 
they will make sure that uh, the discom starts making profits just like the private uh, you know private company is doing you don't need to disinvest the entire stake you can disinvest 51 percent or if you want you can disinvest the entire stake but there's a pushback to that and in uttar pradesh you know the, the state government uh, announced that they were going to uh, disinvest in one discom there was a strike etc etc so there's a pushback across the country because uh, you know the unions don't realize the workers unions don't realize the state comes don't realize that this situation of continuous losses year after year is unsustainable there will come a time when they will just not be able to buy power or if the gen do are, uh, i mean have, are not paid they will not not be able to buy the coal to generate the coal. it's not sustainable so you have pushback from you know the vested interest but in any case my view is something different now you know after thinking over my view is that you know the privatization means or disinvestment means that you are replacing one monopoly with another the state owned monopoly the discom industry is today a state owned monopoly for a citizen like me or any citizen i don't like monopolies because i don't have a choice i am at the mercy of the monopolist that monopoly company which is a state which may be a state owned monopoly but still a monopoly it decides what it wants to do incidentally i am coming out with the rights of consumers which will come out very soon it's with the ministry of law but uh, it is a monopoly now we replace that a public a government monopoly with a private monopoly private companies monopoly again i don't have a choice as a consumer so i said no so i said my my view that why have this monopoly why not open it up this license then what happens is that you know i as a citizen i have a choice there will be multiple companies distributing power in the same area so if i don't like the service of one company i can switch if another company offers me power at lower prices i can switch of course i mean if i am a defaulter i will not be able to switch but otherwise i can switch now that is the future we should be aiming for and that is the future which i think all of us all indians need need to realize once you do that then the sustainability problem is sorted and the people get the best service because people will compete on the basis of service we will set the ceiling tariff and people will also compete on the basis of price now here is what i have to say to you that you know the, i expected associations like fiji and cii uh, to lead the discourse on issues which are important to the economy but you are not doing it and if you because you are not doing it, and because the intelligence is not doing it, the center field of discourse is captured by people who have political interests for whom getting you know getting political power or uh, retaining political power is more important than the long term uh, interest of the not long term national interest they take the center stage as is happening to, uh, now on the cingu border or oh, everybody knows the entire intelligence here knows that the agriculture reforms are great they are good it gives the farmer choice to do away with the strangled hold of the, you know the intermediaries they can now sell wherever they get the maximum price everybody knows that it's a great thing but nobody is speaking up and you are not speaking up and similarly in the power sector reforms i find that you know i am on the loan, loan voice i want all of you to speak up you have immense power you are the intelligence Some of you are, you know, own the press. But you, I mean, uh, I don't see all these things in the discourse. Now that's where you people need to speak. Let's have an open debate on what the system should, be. and tell all the people who are talking about, you know, the, maintaining the status quo. That's not sustainable. It's not good for the future of the country because investment will not come. and if investment will not come we will revert back to being a power deficit country and will remain a third world a power deficit country cannot become an advanced country it cannot become an advanced how can you become an advanced country if you are part i'll stop here we can uh, uh, you can ask questions we can discuss thank right. thank you Thank you, Minister, uh, for that uh, 
I think uh, what we do is we um, request to Mr. Uday Shankar to give the uh, concluding remarks and then um, we take it from there. Mr. Uday Shankar, please. Thank you, Dilip. Thank you, Honorable Minister R.K. Singh, for a very, very spirited, informed, and characteristically frank discussion on the power sector. You've talked about the strengths that we have garnered over the years, but even more importantly, I think for our constituency and our audience, you've talked about the threats that we are facing. I also thank you for being very candid about the role that the industry and the intelligentsia can play in this. I think we all need to do a bit of soul searching because if, if as you said that a developed country cannot be we cannot be a developed country without being fully sufficient in power and sufficiency in power means sufficiency in power generation this transmission and distribution and consumption everything and for that the politics of power has to you know move from political interest to national interest and i think that is what you have highlighted and we thank you for that. i look forward to taking opportunity of time with you, with our industry members, and have a very frank discussion publicly and on, on the forums. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody, any questions, sir? Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister. But my uh, office is open in any case. Yes, thank you. No, I just wanted to say thank you very much, R.K. Singh Ji. It's, a, it's been a pleasure interacting with you, and we look forward to your dynamism to continue. I give my regards to Mr. Sir. I haven't met him for a long time. I will, sir. Thank you. Yes. I tell him that. And if he's in Delhi, we should meet. No? I, I will tell him, sir. Thank you. Namaskar, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.